So good morning and thank you for having me here. So it's really a great pleasure. So uh, as I said, I, I work as an evangelist for Amazon Web Services. Uh, I've been with uh, AWS for six years now, so I've seen lots of different things happening over time. And I also wrote a book on, on serverless because it's really what I'm passionate about, so especially event-driven architecture. So this book has been translated to Chinese and Korean. And I also work with my publisher for a free ebook. So the last one uh, on agile serverless development is a free ebook that everybody can download that is just giving you a broad uh, starting point and understanding what's serverless, what's agile, what are web APIs and other technologies that you may need to think about serverless architectures. And the reason why I'm passionate about uh, serverless is probably the same reason why lots of developers are. So this is the last developer survey from Stack Overflow. They interviewed probably uh, more than 100,000 developers, and those are the top three most loved platforms. So Linux, serverless, and AWS. So this is something that really gives you energy when you wake up in the morning. And what is serverless? So serverless means that we want to empower developers to create applications that do the business logic, implement the features that they want for their own users, their own customers, without thinking about servers. So no servers to provision, manage, operating system to configure. Uh, everything should scale transparently. So you can have one request per, s per month or 1,000 requests per second, and you don't need to care too much about that. Uh, you shouldn't pay for idle. So if you create something as a prototype, an experiment, probably the overall cost would be almost zero, if not zero. We will see why. And still, everything should have availability and resilience built in. So when you deploy some code, for example, on AWS Lambda, it's automatically replicated across multiple data centers in the region. So you have your application in highly availability and scalability across probably at least three data centers if you use the European regions, for example. And the core idea of serverless application is that you have events. Events are something happening in your infrastructure, but you can map events to your business use cases, like a new users have been created, uh, a new file, a new document has been uh, uploaded by a user, or something has been written in a database, and this triggers a, a function. And this function is where your business logic is implemented. You can uh, use multiple languages, so for example, we natively support Node.js, Python, Java, we recently added Go, uh, and also uh, we recently up updated C Sharp to support uh, uh, core, uh, core Net 2.0. And with Java, actually, we, we support everything running on the JVM. So there's people running Scala or Clojure. And actually, those functions are a binary environment. So if you bring your own binaries, you can run whatever. You just need a, a, a theme wrapper in one of those languages. And then your function has no dependencies. So you can use really your own code and access anything. So normally, you have internet visibility. You can create private visibility to your own virtual data center on AWS if you want, but that depends on what you want to build. And there's lots of uh, common use cases that have, we've seen our customers use with serverless. So probably the most common are web application and mobile backends, so where you build your APIs in a serverless way. But we've also seen lots of interesting use cases with data processing, either, either large-scale data processing or uh, real-time streaming data processing. Uh, we've seen interesting uh, use cases with IoT, and we will see that in a minute. Uh, and also chatbots, probably because uh, Lambda has always been integrated with uh, Amazon Alexa. So if you want to build a chatbot with Amazon Alexa, you can use Lambda functions if you want. And uh, we've seen that integrated with all their platforms as well. And the final point that we've seen, especially with enterprises, as a good uh, entry point to serverless is IT automation. You know, all those scripts that we have that run maybe once per hour, once per week to do something like clean up something, take a backup. Uh, those scripts that if they don't run, you don't know because they, they are installed on some physical or virtual server. If you move those on Lambda, uh, you will get all the availability. You can schedule them and, and still probably have no cost because you're far below everything that you would pay with, a, uh, with Lambda. And this is, for example, a use case. So if you have a Roomba va vacuum cleaner, those robots that can clean your house, they're actually so the, 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 the top of the line models. They are connected with AWS Cloud, and they use a whole serverless pipeline for the registration of the new device and connecting the device to the IoT platform uh, and then exchange information and become smarter over time. 
Uh, this is FINRA, this is a financial institution in the US. They monitor the stock market uh, and uh, they <laughs> monitor up to half trillion validation per day. And what they love is that the stock market is very volatile. Some days there are very few transactions, some other days there's lots of transactions and they don't need to do anything now because it's being serverless, they scale up and down just with the platform. Uh, this is Fannie Mae, it's actually the Federal National Mortgage Association in the US, so they monitor mortgages and, and uh, monitor the risk of mortgage, and they run Monte Carlo simulation on Lambda. So in this case, they use large objects on S3 with data, and then they run the simulation on top of that, and what they love is that they can scale up and down very quickly, and the, one of their simulation, it's four times faster using this serverless approach before of their traditional approach that we were using before. And this one, I love it because it's from Italy, where I, the country I'm from. This is uh, Condé Nast in Italy. They built a, a, a photographic website called Photovogue for the Vogue magazine, where photographers can upload their pictures uh, and share the pictures with the magazine. And sometimes they were selected to be published in the magazine. And it was an interesting solution for them because it was faster to develop and cheaper to run. And the idea of cheaper here is bound in the way you pay with uh, serverless. So you pay by the hundreds of milliseconds. Uh, uh, there's a small charge also for every request you make, but usually that doesn't add up too much compared to the uh, time cost. And there's no other fee uh, that, that, that you pay. There's also a, fee, a huge free tier. So if you start using Lambda functions, probably you don't have any cost. We have startups using having up to thousands or sometimes even tens of thousands of users without any cost from Lambda. And with Lambda, one of the control that you have is how much memory you give to each function, and you will pay based on the memory. So the more memory you give, the more cost there will be for those hundreds of uh, milliseconds that you pay for. Uh, and this is linear. And, and that what we discovered is sometimes people don't realize very well how this works. So first of all, if you go beyond 1.8 gigabyte to a single function, you start to see two cores. So if you want to use more power, you need to have at least two threads or two process. Uh, and the other thing is, then, since when you give more memory, you have more CPU power, uh, this is an example of a CPU-bound function that is just computing prime numbers, so probably an ideal case, but it gives you the point. If, if you want to run 1,000 times all the prime numbers below, uh, and compute the prime numbers below 1 million, uh, if you give the minimum amount of memory to the function, 128 megabytes, it takes 12 seconds, and you can see the cost. If you give more memory, it will be faster. So you pay more for the memory, less for the time, and you get the results earlier. So you, if you give one gigabyte of memory, you get the result in one and a half seconds, and the cost is exactly the same. So think about how you configure memory for serverless applications. Sometimes you can increase power, be faster, and don't increase or very limitedly increase your cost. And there's lots of event sources. We will see that. Uh, that you can integrate with Lambda. So you can have data stores. If something happens in a database, a user is written in the user table or is updated, then you trigger your business logic to manage that. You can have endpoints for web APIs, IoT, uh, the Alexa device, as, as I said. And you also can integrate with more traditional event messaging systems. So you can create notification or even receive emails uh, from, uh, uh, from Lambda and process that automatically. So for example, it's very easy to have a, uh, an email system with uh, SAS that receives the email, sends them to the Lambda function, then you can use, for example, an AI service to understand the sentiment of the email, the topic of the email, and then route the email to the best team according to the sentiment, is the customer angry or happy, and, and the topic that you extract from the, from the email. The execution uh, model of Lambda is, 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 is quite strange, so I, I would like to, to clarify this. So sometimes you execute functions in a synchronous way, and sometimes this is asynchronous. So if you use the API gateway, for example, to provide a web interface to your Lambda function, you trigger the Lambda function and you wait for the result. So this is a synchronous invocation. If you uh, trigger a Lambda function from a repository such as Amazon S3, so it's an object storage, if you upload a document, this triggers a Lambda function, will do something. This is an asynchronous invocation because S3 has no interest in the return value of the Lambda function. It just triggers the process. So in this case, you need to manage the error yourself. So we will catch any error, retry the functions two times if there is an error, and then you can optionally configure a dead letter queue where we will put the events that create the error. So you have to think about asynchronous execution because there's no, no, no way to know what they do if you don't check the error, the, 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 the feedback from the logs 
or, uh, or the feedback that we provide for, this, for those errors. For some specific use cases, like uh, ordered streams of event, we have a third execution model. This is similar to the asynchronous one, but we preserve the order. For example, if you have a, an ordered stream of event from Amazon DynamoDB, so this is a, a database, the order is important because if you update something and then you update it again, you can just change the order of those updates. So there we preserve the order, and there's a specific use case that we, uh, that, that we implement. For S3, this is not true. So if you upload 1,000 files, we trigger 1,000 functions asynchronously, and there's no order that you need on those files. And another important thing is security. So I think security is everyone's jobs, and it should be part of the development cycle. And with Lambda function, you get a very fine-grained permission model. So at function level, you can give permission of what the function can do. So it can read here, it can write there. And also, you can uh, give permission to who can use the function. So you are actually decoupling the implementation, so what you do inside the functions, with who can consume and use the function. So from a security perspective, it's, it's very interesting, because uh, if you need to uh, give access to something, you can use the Lambda function as an intermediary between you and the end user. The most common integration of Lambda function is with the API gateway to give a web interface to the Lambda function so that you can build your REST uh, APIs if you want. And uh, API Gateway is actually quite a complex product. It has lots of features because it can uh, also defend you from distributed denial of service attacks. It can manage the authentication and the authorization at API level. And also you can use it to distribute API keys with throttling, metering, and billing if you want. Uh, for your users, depending on the tier of the API key that they're using. And when we launched the API gateway a few years ago, I think three years ago now, uh, we uh, decided to have a flexible product. So the idea was, if you want to integrate a Lambda function or whatever uh, web interface with the API gateway, uh, you can use Velocity Templates. Velocity Templates is a syntax from the Apache Velocity project, where you can define a template that can translate the input in the output and vice versa. What we found out over time is that most customers were always writing the same templates again and again, because an HTTP request has always the same fields. It's not so unpredictable. So we created, uh, some time ago, this default proxy integration. So this is what I would suggest you to use if you want to build uh, an API with Lambda, uh, where you get in input all the possible uh, payloads of an HTTP request, including binary a content if you want. And then there's a, a, a standard output where you give the uh, return value for the HTTP, like 200 OK, 404, this is a miss. The headers, the body, and eventually you can use a binary content, return a binary content if you want. So what happens if you start building serverless applications? Is that probably you don't create a single function, you start to create multiple functions that work together. So my suggestion is uh, when you have anything more complex than two, three functions, uh, manage your application uh, as code, of course, and also your infrastructure as code. So that means that uh, you, you should define the architecture of your application in a template file and tie the architecture with the actual code of your application and version them together. So this is something that we already suggested over time for more traditional application, and we have a service that does that. It's called AWS CloudFormation. But we realized that it was not really optimized for serverless. And that's why I want to introduce you to SAM. So SAM is the serverless application model. It's a, an open source specification that we released for the whole serverless ecosystem, where you can very easily define function, APIs, table, and the interaction between those components through events. And it actually can be extended with anything that CloudFormation supports. So if you want to go beyond those components, you can add anything that CloudFormation understands. So this is an example of a, a SAM template that creates a function. So this is where you define that this, is, this resource is a function. It's a serverless function. Here you tie this function to a web API, so it, it will answer to anything that goes into that path. This is the line that tells to CloudFormation that you're not using the traditional syntax, but we're using the SAM extension to be fa shorter. And this will implement all the backend resources that you need to run this very simple uh, serverless application. This is because actually there's lots behind, because you need to create the function, the policy, the resources, the permissions, the API gateway has different components, because it has can have different stages, uh, deployments. So everything is managed 
uh, transparently. If you were to use CloudFormation directly, this would be the equivalent template. So now you understand why we created SAM and, and it would be ridiculous to not use it in this scenario. And when you have a SAM template, your deployment is very easy because this is an example with our CLI. You can use different interfaces if you want. And basically, you can just give your code and the template to the CLI, and there are two steps. The first step, package, will take your code, the template, and write that into an S3 bucket. And the second step, deploy, will give this to CloudFormation and will actually implement those templates in what we call a stack. So you will have one implementation. It can be your production environment, your one of your test environments, and so on. And this deploy function can also update. So if you make any change to your code or your uh, architecture, if you redeploy, you repackage and redeploy, it will compare the difference and just do the update to your uh, environment. So it's two lines of code that if you put inside your uh, continuous integration and continuous deployment pipeline can really easily create one or more environments for you to, to use or test, or run automatic test, and so on. But what I realized is that even if you, we provide all these tools, if you want to build something like this, so this is an example of a completely meaningless serverless application that is doing lots of things without any purpose, but it gives you the idea of the connections that you can create. Uh, to, cr to write the SAM template here, it could be complex. Also, thinking from a developer perspective in an event-driven architecture is different from what we used to do normally. So that's why I created this project. This is an open source project that I created. It's a personal project. It's not an AWS official product. It's called Serverless by Design, that you can use it to design, th think about event-driven architectures, and then you can also create automatically the same template to build what you just designed. So let's have a quick look at it. So the, the address is just this. And I zoom a little bit, not too much, because otherwise JavaScript fights back. So the idea here is that an event-driven architecture is, is actually mapped into a network model. And for the mathematicians in the audience, it's actually a directed graph. So a graph with nodes and edges, and the edges have a direction. So let's start adding something. So let's say that I want to add a node, and this is my API. So I create an API gateway. This is my uh, API. I usually use camel case. And then uh, I can connect this API to an implementation. So this is a Lambda function. And this Lambda function is actually my backend, because any call to my API will be served by a Lambda function, this Lambda function. And then I can add a repository. So maybe I need to write files, so I can add an S3 bucket. And this is my bucket. This is an object storage where I can store files. And I can add another node. Uh, it can, is, for example, a, a DynamoDB table. So this is my database table. And then I can add edges. So for example, I can say this API gateway works with this function. And the, this platform will automatically infer what's the purpose of this link. So this is, uh, in this case, an integration. Uh. Then I can add an edge here. And this will give permission to the Lambda function to read and write from the bucket and from the DynamoDB table. And this is a basic application. Then I can start thinking about the event-driven model. So for example, I can add another node here. And this is a Lambda function that will process everything that happens on S3. So this is my bucket processor. And then I can add another node here that is another Lambda function. And this is my table processor. So any change in my table will trigger this business logic that will do something. So for example, a new user has been added, so I need to provision other resources. So this is my table processor. And I can just add an edge here and an edge here. And now I have something that is more of a, an event-driven architecture. And then maybe my Lambda function here needs to write on the DynamoDB table because it's extracting data from the document that I uploaded on S3 and needs to write some metadata and index that. So I can add an edge here. And in the same way, I can maybe from this Lambda function write some, a file on S3. And you see, things can get weird, but it's, it's, it, it, you see the flow of your business logic tied to the, how the data uh, flows inside your application. So now I build something here. We can maybe uh, zoom a little bit. I can now give this application a name because I finished thinking this, uh, the first part. So I can call this my prototype app. 
uh, you can choose between a few platforms. So I don't support everything. I only support platforms that are uh, with native scripts so that you don't need to do a build phase. So Node.js and Python for now. So let's use Node.js 8 that we support since a few weeks. And then you can output to SAM. Uh, uh, this is open source, so a guy in Dubai in one day added support also for the serverless framework, and I'm still waiting for someone to do the same for Terraform, even if I have someone in the Nordics that is starting to think about that. And now I can just output and build. So if I click here, build. Uh, okay. Probably I, I changed it, so let's just look at the download that I already did here, and you get this. So this is actually your prototype app where you have the template, and we can see the template here. This is similar to what we saw before. So it's a serverless template. We declare the function, the permission, so it can read from the bucket, read and write from the database table. You can edit this template. So if you know that you only need to read from the bucket, you can remove the put bucket the object here and you just leave read permissions. Here you have the information on the bucket, the DynamoDB table uh, that you can, of course, customize in the index and something. Uh, you have the, the, the other functions that are triggered and so on. So this is all the information you need. So now what you can do, you can go here. So let's go on download backup my prototype app. And what I can do, I can just go back here, copy this two sentence. Let's go back here to the editor just for, I can give an S3 bucket. So I have a bucket that is called Danilo. Let's call this uh, Linz uh, demo. This is the name of the stack. So now I can take these two commands, paste them here. So I'm packaging my application and I'm deploying my application in, a, in the first environment. So as you said, the first step is the creation of the change set. That means that it's, I'm comparing what I want to create with what is already there. Now there's nothing, so it's a new default. And then the second step is to implement the difference between what's already there and what I need to achieve with this template. So if I go here and I go, for example, on CloudFormation, I start to see that I have the Linz stack in, product, uh, in development, and you can see here that I'm creating lots of resources. So it will take a few minutes, so let's move just forward uh, from this. So this is what we built. So what's the next step? So we saw how easy it is to deploy, but our customer told us that when you have a large architecture, it's not so easy to deploy all the different modules at once. So they want to do safe deployment. So we uh, added this possibility to uh, manage canary or linear deployments at function level. So the idea is that for every function that you create with Lambda, you can have multiple versions, and versions are immutable. So you can have version 1, version 2, version 3. Those are immutable when you declare them. And then you can create a dynamic alias, like production or test, and you can link an alias to a specific version. So test is linked to version 3, and production is linked to version 2. And now this works, because then if I want to promote a, a version uh, uh, to production, I just move the alias, and I will use the alias in all my dependent configurations. This works, but still you have an atomic uh, versioning, so you can either use one version or, or the other. So you have version 5, version 6, version 7. So what we added is that with Lambda, you can now have a, an alias that can link two different versions with weights. So 95% of the requests go to version 6, and then I can start to move 5% of my traffic to version 7 to see if that works. This is can be used, for example, for canary deployments. This is cool, but coordinating all of these it would be a pain for customers, so we integrated this with SAM. And so if we take this SAM template that is creating a single function, we just need to add these five lines. And with these five lines, all the functions in this template will be deployed using a deployment strategy that you can define. So this first line tells that this is a global configuration. You can optionally do that for every function, but probably doesn't make sense. This tells which alias to use. So I'm using the live alias. So the live alias will always be updated with any deployment that I make. And then I can add a deployment preference. And in this case, I use a, a canary 
a canary uh, 10 percent 10 minutes that means that I deploy to 10 percent of my users for 10 minutes if everything works I roll out to everybody otherwise I roll back and then you can add these hooks and alarms so hooks are two lambda functions that you can write that can monitor your environment before and after the deployment. If they fail, we will roll back. So you can monitor before the deployment that everything works and after the deployment that everything works. If either of two fails, we will roll back. And then you can define one or more alarms. If one of these alarms is triggered, then we will roll back. And my suggestion is integrate this with your current infrastructure monitoring platform and don't uh, think only of infrastructure metrics because that's not telling you all really if the deployment is going well, but think of business metrics. For example, uh, Netflix, they do lots of canary deployments and they measure the number of play per second. So the number of, of times people is clicking the play button per second. If they see that a deployment is changing with some statistic significance, the number of play per second from their expected value, then they know that they did something. Probably they broke something and then they can roll back manually or automatically. If you create the alarm here, you can roll back automatically, for example. And you can monitor each deployment from the console if you want. So there's a web interface that tells you what's happening, where you are. You can do, uh, for example, DDR deployments where you deploy to 10% of your users every 10 minutes and then it takes much more time to roll out, but you can monitor eff effectively what's happening. So let's have a quick look at how that works. So if we go back to, to serverless by design, you can just click here, select your deployment preference, and this will uh, be one of those. So these are the predefined ones. So canary, 10% for 5, 10, 15, or 30 minutes, and then we roll out to everybody, or linear. So each, each every one minute, two, three, or 10 minutes, we roll out 10% more of your users up to reach 100%, still monitoring what's happening uh, with your platform. So this is something that I strongly suggest. Uh, it, it's, it's, you can test whatever you want, but you will discover some bugs only in production, and this is a good way to test new features in production in a control, in a control way. Uh, and this works also, can work also together with feature flags or feature releases if, if you want. So let's have a look. I think the template that we already provisioned was already using uh, global deployment, so a canary 10% for five minutes. Uh, so what we can do, we can see, first of all, if the deployment worked. Yeah, so Lint's demo finished. So if I go here and I go on Lambda, we should have the backend function that for the Lint's demo that is being implemented. And this has a live alias. The live alias is linked to the API gateway, and I can see here the automatically generated endpoint. So if we go here and we paste, let's just use hello, and wonder, uh, oh, uh, a nice forbidden, so probably my demo will fail because I don't have time to, to de debug this on stage. Uh, ah, I, I, I forgot prod. Yeah, so we we have the, the amazing hello world. What I can do, we're probably we know time to do the old test, but what I can do, I can go here, I can now update my bucket for uh, my uh, backend. This now saying hello world and say hello lint. So I save this, let's close. Okay, now that it's saved, I can go here and I can repackage. Uh, yeah, and redeploy. So the redeploy now is doing the change set. It will see that the code of one function is different, so it will redeploy the function. And since I configure the, 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 deploy, the canary deployments, for 10 minutes, I will have 10% of the request on the new version. So uh, there's no time for doing that probably now. We can maybe see at the end. But if we reload in, the, in those 10 minutes, we can see that we get hello world, hello lins, and then we move to hello lins after, after the deployment has been accepted by the canary phase. So actually, this was all for me. So this is uh, my takeaway for this session. So the idea is when you start to build anything complex, and this is not only for, for, uh, for serverless, manage your infrastructure as code. Use a template systems 
choose the one that you want. We have our own tool, but we're open to Terraform and uh, serverless framework or whatever. Choose a tool that can help you describe your architecture in a text file. Because if you write your architecture in a text file, you can bind these to your uh, source management tool, and then you can version it, you can control who is making change, and also you can start to apply software development best practice to the development of the infrastructure. For example, we always talk about Agile. You can apply something from Agile to infrastructure management, like doing small changes and quick feedback. This is the same that you do with code. You can do that with architectures. And you can avoid lots of the mistakes that we normally do when we manage and change the infrastructure suddenly. The same second step is think about safe deployment in production. Think about uh, canary release uh, or linear releases. Uh, monitor the, rele the release automatically and think of one, two, maximum three business metrics that can tell you if your deployment is working good. So you can monitor the latency of the load balancer, the latency of your APIs, and this is a good metric. But if your business metric, so if you're an e-commerce, think about how many purchases per minute my customer are doing, how many searches per minute my customer are doing in my uh, uh, catalog. All those information is telling you more than what you get just by the platform infrastructure metrics. And try to join these values together. Uh, so define alarms and hooks to do that. And third point, define a continuous integration and continuous deployment pipeline. We have lots of tools that you can do. Uh, we took some tools that we use inside of Amazon. We have a tool for deployment that is called Apollo, and it makes it available as a product. It's called Deploy, called the Deploy now. We have a tool inside for uh, defining your continuous delivery pipeline with all the stages, with uh, manual approval if you want, with automatic test. And it's called pipelines. It was not uh, a fancy name, so we changed it in code pipeline for the public, so you can use it at code pipeline. And we also have a build system, so you can use Jenkins or you can use our own management if you want. It's called code build. If you want to use a completely external pipeline, it's definitely okay. And uh, think about our command line interface. The example that I give you can give you an idea of how quickly is to integrate automatic deployment with any external tool, because you just need to run those two commands to, to, to automate uh, incremental deployment for your application. And maybe we can just go back and see if we are in the middle of the, of the deployment. So let's go here on CloudFormation, let's see. There are lots of events, uh, and we can just, maybe just for the sake of time, monitor the deployment management. And here you see there's currently the deployment is uh, is going on. Maybe that would fix the error I did before, I don't know which one. And we see that now we have uh, the first pre-validation step, so that's one of the two hooks is okay because I didn't configure it, so it was automatic. Then we have 90% uh, on the original version and 10% on the new version. And we have all the information of what is happening here and if this will work or rollback. And of course, you can also manually force the rollback with a stop here if you want. And probably we are now in the traffic shifting, so I don't know why it was not working, so maybe I have just two minutes to to see what was happening. So this is the URL, uh, this is the, let's just test it, because testing is always good. I get to configure a test event. Uh, uh, let's test with an API call. Uh, this is an API call. Create a test event, test. So the Lambda function is working and the feedback I get looks good. So probably it was, uh, I think the environment, uh, I think everything was just bound to my cut and paste mistakes. Uh, so let's see, oh, this environment was called prod. Okay. So, okay. So I'm running now this multiple times. And of course we, Maybe I talk too much and the deployment finished. No, we still should see. Maybe I'm caching too much. I, you know, you, you test everything, but then something changes when you do the live demo. We should see some hello lint, okay. That this part will not work. I, you have to trust me on this. So, thank you.